Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Kang and today I'll be talking about efficient and reliable query processing using machine learning. This is work done as part of the Sanford Don Lab with a variety of collaborators, including professors Peter Bayless and Matei Saharia. So to set the stage for this talk, unstructured data is ubiquitous and cheap. Uh, for example, there are now high quality uh, sensors that are now incredibly cheap, for example, under a dollar for a webcam. And these webcams can be deployed to uh, uh, collect data about the real world, for example, about the street corner in Taipei. In addition, there's a variety of um, uh, sensors, uh, uh, and also to put some numbers on this, London alone has over 500,000 CCTVs, which can all collect data about the real world. Additionally, autonomous vehicles are becoming more and more prevalent, and they uh, contain a variety of sensors uh, that also um, produce lar large amounts of data about the real world, which we can then query. And so many research and commercial applications would, be, would benefit from being able to analyze uh, this data. For example, a, a traffic analyst can ask, ask queries of the forum, how many cars passed by this intersection on Monday? Uh, our collaborators in the Stanford Ecology Department are interested in finding hummingbirds and video for ecological analysis. And uh, SEC lawyers may be interested in, in finding, uh, say, examples of bribes. Luckily for us, uh, the, um, machine learning models now perform well on a range of benchmark tasks, which has largely been driven by research in both academia and industry. For example, computer uh, CNNs can now perform well on image cl classification benchmarks, uh, supposedly outperforming human performance. And there's been great strides in language understanding via um, uh, BERT and other uh, large models that have been developed recently. So to understand what, uh, to, how to, what this would look like uh, in a, with a concrete example, I'll describe a case study for finding uh, hummingbirds and video for ecological analysis, which is done in collaboration with Stanford ecologists. The goal is to match field readings with hummingbird visits. Uh, but unfortunately, only about 0.1% of the video contains hummingbirds because this is very rare. On the left-hand side, I'm showing a clip from this video, which is not a still, it's actually looping, uh, and most of this video is empty. And the query would be to find, say, 95% of the hung, 95 of the instances of the hummingbirds. So can we deploy machine learning to help? Well, in the best case, uh, we would do something like this. We would take a, a off-the-shelf model, which, would, which we would then deploy over all the data, and then ideally find all the hummingbirds. And for example, on the left-hand side, uh, in this video clip, I'm showing uh, an example of where this does well. Unfortunately, there are two problems with deploying machine learning at scale. And the first is that machine learning models are unreliable. From the same video from before, I'm actually showing an example where the machine learning model does poorly. It's detecting this, uh, this flower as uh, a bird. And similarly, it can also confuse, say, a human hand as a bird as well. So small shifts in distribution can substantially harm the performance of even state-of-the-art deep neural networks. The second challenge is that deploying machine learning is expensive. There are many ways in, uh, in which these are expensive, but one way is that labeling data sets can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And another is that state-of-the-art uh, neural networks can uh, execute as slow as three frames per second, for example, if we're analyzing video. To explore this a little bit more, there's actually a fundamental trade-off between accuracy and speed and or cost. What I'm showing here on this plot is the cost of using a human to label uh, data versus an expensive DNN and versus a cheap DNN. On the x-axis is the accuracy, and on the y-axis is the cost on a log scale. So as you can see, uh, to obtain higher accuracy, we need to, uh, uh, there's huge differences in costs uh, ranging from orders of magnitude. And in this talk, I'll, I'll focus on the question of, can we get to the bottom right, which is high accuracy at low cost? And so in my work, um, we, uh, I asked the question, can we use unreliable and expensive machine learning models in query processing? Uh, and, the and what I'll talk about in this talk is query processing techniques to efficiently deploy a fixed set of machine learning models with statistical guarantees on query results. Uh, and this has been published in BLDB uh, in 2018 through uh, 2021, uh, and I'll have some uh, of the links uh, later. I'll also very briefly talk about uh, methods for improving machine learning models for, very for better query accuracy and or speeds by allowing users to specify when errors are occurring. 
Unfortunately, I won't have time to get into this in detail, but I'll give a sneak preview of results. OK, so the first thing I'll talk about and the, what the, this bulk of this uh, talk will be about are efficient query processing with machine learning models. To get a sense of what this looks like, uh, I'll, I'll first describe what I call the naive method. So suppose we had the uh, ecological use case from before, where we have, say, a video and a query, say, of the form, find the hummingbirds. One way to answer this query is to execute uh, uh, an Oracle method, which is, might be an expensive DNN or a human labeler, over all the video, and then store the resulting outputs into a database. And then we can use this database to serve uh, queries, um, for example, the, the uh, hummingbird example from before. However, one of the things I will talk about in this talk is that oracles are used in higher level queries, um, despite being incredibly expensive. And so what are some examples of higher level queries? Well, the three I'll talk about in this talk are selection queries, aggregation, and limit queries. And I'll describe how to accelerate these two queries using uh, these three query types using uh, some core primitives. And the two primitives I will use uh, in this talk are sampling and proxy scores. Uh, sampling is an old idea that's been used in approximate query processing and a variety of other uh, techniques, which can reduce the number of records considered by looking at a small fraction of the data. However, this can still be expensive with uh, modern deep learning methods. So we'll focus on another thing as well, another technique as well, which is the technique of using approximations. For example, here M might be the, the uh, expensive method and A might be an approximation which is noisy, but still fairly close to the ground truth. And in this talk, I'll focus on methods of combining sampling and uh, using approximate methods for accelerated query processing. The first query type I'll talk about are selection queries with guarantees. And I'll also talk about aggregation queries and limit queries after that. In this first query type, we're trying to select instances of typically rare events. Uh, as before, uh, the naive method to do this would, would be to take all the data records, for example, frames of a video, and annotate them with a human or complex model. These queries would take the form find 95% of the hummingbirds or find 95% of the mentions of bribes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as I mentioned, a common technique is to use uh, approximation, and in this talk, we'll call them proxy models to reduce the cost of the selection. Generically, the way this works is to take a proxy model and evaluate it over all the data which is feasible because a proxy model is cheap, and then sample the oracle on some fraction of this data. This is widely been explored for video analytics, including some work uh, done uh, in our lab uh, and a variety of others, which has been published in the uh, database community. Going back to our ecological analysis example, um, this query would take the form, find 95% of the hummingbirds, uh, using, say, mask RCNN as a proxy or an approximation with human labels as ground truth. However, one key uh, requirement that, I, that, I've, uh, that I've omitted from the previous slide is that many queries require statistical guarantees on accuracy. Concretely, this would take the form, find 95% of the hummingbird frames with failure probability at most 5%, uh, and there's other examples as well. And the reason that this is critical is that scientists require high probability of success to publish. And this is also important for any downstream application that requires a large amount of resources to analyze the, uh, the results. Unfortunately, prior work that uses the proxy models uh, can fail to achieve statistical guarantees on, on failure probability. What I'm showing here is, is an accuracy over multiple runs over uh, the same data set using the naive method of using proxies and using R algorithms. As we can see, using the naive method, um, we can, uh, it, it achieves uh, on median uh, uh, around 60% precision, which is substantially below the dotted line of, of a 95%, 90% target, and can in fact return precisions below 20%. Uh, 20%. In contrast, our methods uh, are uh, always uh, satisfy the, uh, uh, the the precision target in this particular case. Okay, so now that I've motivated the, the need for uh, selection queries with guarantees, I'll first describe our exact problem statement. 
And this, uh, and uh, for the render of this talk, we'll focus on what we call the recall target. And here, the goal is to, uh, in words, return a set of records that achieve, say, 90% recall using a fixed number of Oracle samples with some uh, pro failure probability, say, 95%. The goal is to return a set of records with precision as high as possible. Uh, there are two things I want to note here. The first is that in contrast to uh, scalar aggregates, for example, in standard approximate query processing, here we want to return a set of records. And the second is that uh, we can uh, trivially satisfy this query by returning uh, the entire, all the records. And so, but that will have low precision. And that's why we want to have as high uh, precision as high as possible. As a concrete example from the Hummingbird case, uh, here we would uh, say, have a form, query the form, select star from Hummingbird video, where Hummingbird present, and this might be a callback to a human labeler, with some Oracle limit, I'd say using mask RCNN uh, as a proxy, with some recall target and some uh, failure probability. Okay, now that I describe our problem statement, I'll describe algorithms for executing these queries uh, efficiently. Um, the, uh, the overview of the algorithm for all algorithms we'll, we'll consider uh, take this form. We first order records by proxy score. And as you can see here, uh, the records in blue are the positive la uh, label, positive data records, and the records in red are negative. And we assume that the proxy score uh, gives us some information about whether or not the a record satisfies a predicate. So the blues are clustered by, at the top. We would then sample uh, a fraction of this data using the Oracle label. And so as an example, we might uh, obtain this set of records uh, in our sample. We would then choose a selection threshold based on these sample labels. For example, the empirical threshold here for say 50% uh, recall or 60% recall would be this dotted line in the sample. In fact, it achieves 100% uh, uh, recall. And then we would um, return all records above the threshold. So in other words, the ones indicated by the, the, the arrow here. Uh, would be, which would be these two records. And, and uh, these two records would be returned. So I mentioned that the naive methods of using proxies can fail to achieve statistical guarantees and accuracy. And so to illustrate this, uh, let's look at this particular example. As before, we have all the data records and, and a sample. And then we would choose a selection threshold based on the sample labels. In this, uh, in this sample, 60% recall would be achieved by drawing uh, the, the dotted line there and, ret and returning everything above uh, this dotted line. Unfortunately, in this particular example, because of the, the variance in sampling, uh, this would only return a recall of 33%, which does not satisfy the recall target. And this is, a uh, um, and in this particular example, it's, it's a little bit extreme, but this actually holds in more general, generality. I'll show many more examples of this uh, in our evaluation in a few slides. The key idea we use to achieve, to achieve statistical guarantees on accuracy is to use confidence intervals to have a buffer to ensure a high probability of success. Concretely, let, let's return to the example from before, where here we're sampling uh, uniformly at random from all the data records. As before, we would select. Uh, we would use. Uh, we would uh, uh, set a selection threshold based on the sample labels, and here the empirical threshold is as before. But what we do is we have a confidence interval uh, over the selection threshold. In this particular case, because the sample only contains a single positive record, uh, our confidence intervals are, are, must be very very loose. As a result, we return the entire data set, and have a precision of only twenty percent, which is undesirable. Uh, so to fix this, I developed an al algorithms with some collaborators, including Edward Gann and professors Peter Bayless, uh, Tatsunori Hashimoto, and, and uh, Matei Zaharia at, uh, at Stanford University. And here we sample with importance weights. As you can see, the sample is different from before. Intuitively, what we're doing is we're sampling where the proxy scores are higher, which, which we basically expect to have more examples of positives. We would then choose a, a, a selection threshold for example, here, the empirical cutoff for 60% recall in this sample would be over would be this dotted line, and then we would draw a confidence intervals, a confidence interval, returning say uh, these records. Because the 
uh, we have more positive examples, we can draw tighter confidence intervals and therefore return higher precision. Again, this is one particular example of this query, uh, but I'll show more examples where we do uh, substantially better than uniform sampling on a variety of real world data sets. And in fact, I'll talk about how we evaluate our, our algorithms uh, now, starting with the evaluation setup. <clears throat> we evaluate on four real world data sets spanning images, videos, and text. Um, with proxies ranging from ResNets to LSTMs to BERTs and oracles ranging from human labels to an expensive uh, deep neural network. The first thing I show is that our algorithms, our, uh, our sub algorithms are cheap relative to exhaustive labeling. Uh, this is because all parts of our algorithm, uh, both the sampling, the proxy, and the oracle are substantially cheaper than uh, evaluating over the entire data set. We also show that prior work can fail to respect error bounds in the recall target setting. On the left-hand side of all four of these plots, I'm showing the naive method. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing uh, sub-G, uh, our algorithms. What I'm showing here is a recall over many runs over the, over the algorithm over these data sets. And as we can see, naive methods without correction can fail over 50% of the time. And this is a consistent pattern across all data sets. In contrast, our algorithms achieve the target recall with high probability, which is expected due to our uh, confidence intervals. We also show that our algorithms outperform uniform sampling on the recall target. For each of these plots, I'm showing the precision, which is the what we want to maximize, along with uniform sampling and our algorithms. At the bottom of each of these plots, um, you can see that uniform sampling is sample inefficient. Uh, and, and in fact, that our sub-G algorithms outperform in all settings, uh, sometimes by up to uh, uh, 10 or 20 times uh, higher precision. There's many other experiments in the paper, and also our code is open source. Uh, we give algorithms for <coughs> the precision and joint target settings. We also show that our, our algorithms are not sensitive to choices of parameters, um, choices of computing confidence intervals, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're interested in trying it out, feel free to go to this, uh, to, this to the GitHub repository and download our code. I'll also give my email uh, at the end of the talk to uh, if you want to uh, uh, talk with me directly. Okay, so now that I've described how to accelerate uh, selection queries, I'll now describe how to accelerate uh, aggregation queries. In these queries, uh, we might ask questions of the form, what is the average number of cars per frame? Uh, the SQL query would look something like this. And we have an error tolerance because we're using sampling. And these queries are typically for understanding bulk properties of video. For example, the total number of cars that, that are, uh, appear. As before, we use uh, two key ideas. Um, and I'll, I also want to contrast with this with some prior work uh, for binary detection, which is uh, basically the, uh, the prior work I showed before, which tells you whether or not a, a frame, for example, in the video might satisfy some predicate. Unfortunately, this prior work doesn't help for busy videos, uh, doesn't help count, uh, and doesn't provide statistical guarantees. As a concrete example of this, um, if we ask if there's a car in this frame of video, binary detection would just say yes, but it wouldn't tell us how many cars. What I introduced in my research is to use uh, sampling and also proxy models for counting. Uh, as we can see here, the proxy model may say 17 cars where the ground truth might actually be 20, uh, but it's still uh, fairly close to the, to the uh, answer. But the question is, how can we combine sampling and proxy models? Because uh, there's, uh, uh, because uh, the sampling can uh, reduce the number of samples considered, and the proxy model might give us a noisy signal, but it's not clear how to combine them. Well, as before, I will, uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, this is actually a different technique. Um, so in this particular case, here M of T is the ground truth uh, what we're comparing against. So for example, an expensive DNN or a human. And here A of T is an approximation. What we can do is that we can define a new uh, statistic, which we'll call M star which is a simple arithmetic combination of M and A. Importantly, we don't actually need to know M star for the entire data set. We actually only need samples from M star. And what we show is that if we sample from M star, we actually get the, the, the same answer as sampling from the ground truth. 
And importantly, uh, you don't need to worry about this exact computation here. Um, but the variance decreases with the correlation uh, between the proxy and the target. Uh, and so concretely, um, if you care about uh, the, the mathematics of this, um, the variance of our new estimator M star is equal to one minus the correlation between uh, uh, our proxy and the, the true uh, signal times the, variant, the old variance. To use this to obtain a cheaper query processing, we combine this with an algorithm called EBS stopping. Uh, again, I won't get into the details here, but the intuition is that it's an always valid stopping algorithm based on the sample invariance. And so lower variance, which our algorithms provide, will terminate earlier. Concretely, um, what, I, what we'll show is that uh, both the naive method and using binary detection, in other words, whether or not there's, for example, there's a car in the frame, uh, are both very, very slow. Random sampling can dramatically improve performance, uh, but our algorithms can in fact improve performance uh, even more uh, by using uh, these proxy models. I'll now describe how to accelerate limit queries. As a concrete example of a limit query in words, uh, this might be able to form fine clips of at least one bus and at least five cars. The SQL query would look something like this. Uh, here, importantly, there's, um, there's a limit on the number of records we want to return. And these are typically used for manual inspection of rare events. To optimize limit queries, we'll, we'll use our proxy models for ranking. Concretely, the proxy model might return some probabilities for, say, these two separate frames. Uh, and the proxy model for the, uh, for the top frame would uh, be more confident than it would be on the bottom frame, uh, which, is, which is desired. Uh, the intuition behind our algorithm is to essentially uh, bias the search towards high confidence areas. Uh, concretely, we would evaluate the top frame first and find that this satisfies the predicate before evaluating the bottom frame. Um, as before, uh, we showed that our algorithms can substantially outperform uh, naive approaches for limit queries. Uh, these are the two baselines that I described before, the naive algorithm and binary detection. In uh, interestingly, for this particular uh, query, a sam a random sampling actually performs relatively poorly uh, because we're looking for rare events. And in contrast, our algorithms can substantially outperform the baselines, uh, in particular, if we index our, uh, our, uh, 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 the proxy model's outputs. And the key takeaway here is to, is to not call the expensive model uh, and use the approximation whenever possible. There's many more results and also code available. Uh, the two the, the queries I talked about before are uh, described in full detail in papers in VLDB 2017, 2020, and 2020. And I also have some uh, work on generating these proxy scores, which I won't have time to get in today. Uh, and the code for that is available below. And finally, I have some work on fast inference for visual analytics, which again, I don't have time to get into, but uh, feel free to reach out to me if you're interested. I'll, I'll briefly mention some work on improving machine learning models by finding errors. But first, why do we uh, care about errors? Well, machine learning models can make errors that affect downstream analytics. For example, here we have this uh, example of a car that flickers in and out of a video. And on here we have an example of uh, uh, boxes of cars that highly overlap in unrealistic ways. What we notice is that uh, machine learning models can make systematic errors. I won't have time to get into how we uh, leverage this, but I'll show some results for how we use this to improve models in a few slides. But one thing I also want to mention is that uh, there's also uh, labels like uh, there's also errors that can occur in human labels, and in this particular data set, uh, these two data sets I'm actually showing are from autonomous vehicle data sets, which are user trained models that, that, that go into uh, the the models that now that will will you know supposedly be driving our cars in a few years from now, and in red in both of these uh, in both of these examples, I'm highlighting. Um, uh, cars that are missed by a leading uh, commercial vendor that produces human labels for autonomous vehicles. As we can see on the left, there's many missing cars in, in addition to a, miss, a car that's, that's in motion that's also missing. And on the right, there's a missing motorcycle. 
This is critical because errors in ground truth labels can cause downstream safety risks, which goes beyond just analytics. Uh, one of the things I want to leave, uh, I want to just highlight is that uh, these errors, both in machine learning models and in ground truth errors, can be uh, can lead to dramatic uh, consequences for, for people uh, in the real world. So for example, in Uber's self, fatal self-driving car crash, uh, the automated driving system changed the classification between a pedestrian several times, alternating between vehicle, bicycle, and another. Uh, and so it's critical to make these make sure that these models are, uh, are high quality and that the labels we're using to train these models are also of high quality. Um, what I'll leave with is, is just actually some results. Here we're showing some qualitative improvement. On the left, I'm showing the, the original model that I showed in a few, a, a few slides before. And on the right, the best retrained model. And this is over the same video clip. As we can see on the right-hand side, uh, the model is much more confident over the uh, results and, and Flickr is much, much less. And so the key takeaway is that uh, it's really important to keep track of when your model may be making errors and also uh, to vet the quality of your human labels. Um, please don't forget to leave feedback, especially if you enjoyed this talk. Um, I believe they'll be sending out a link to give feedback later. But in conclusion, uh, analytics over unstructured data is important for, uh, for both commercial and research applications. Uh, but unfortunately, machine learning models are unreliable and expensive. But in my research, I show that we can use cheap proxies to get statistical guarantees on downstream queries uh, efficiently. Uh, all of our research code is, is, is or will be made uh, open source. Uh, and you can, uh, and uh, the link here will link out to several uh, of the uh, work I, I described in, uh, in this talk today. And my email is here. I'll be around to answer any questions. And furthermore, if you have any uh, particular things that you'd like to talk about or collaborate on, uh, my email is here below. Uh, thank you for your time. And again, if you've enjoyed this talk, uh, uh, feel free to leave some feedback.